Hey G Matters, I'm back with another interesting challenge and concept. Can you solve this question correctly in under 90 seconds? Well, pause this video and give this a shot. All right, assuming you've attempted this question, let's see whether you got it right or wrong. As you can see, the correct answer is D. Only 48% of the test takers managed to get this question right. But what's more interesting is that 32% fall for the incorrect answer choice A. In other words, 32% managed to reject answer choice D. Now let's take a look and figure out what is the difference between these two choices. Now, I'm sure you must have spotted these already, but the primary difference between A and D are, number one, the semicolons. And two, there's this missing word, or. Now, I'm sure you must have guessed by now that the presence or absence of the word or doesn't really make much of a difference to the meaning or interpretation of answer choice A. That means the difference boils down to the role of the semicolon in answer choice D. So this means that the 32% people who rejected choice D were not aware of this application of the semicolon. And that is my topic for today. Hello everyone. I, Abhishek Raj, am a senior verbal expert here at EGMAT and today I bring to you the use of a semicolon as a super comma. Let's understand with the help of an example. And here is that example on your screen. Let's read. The new Mega Mart sells groceries, toiletries on the ground floor, clothing and accessories on the second floor, stationery, music, books and toys on the third floor and luggage, housewares and electronics on the fourth floor. So pretty straightforward sentence. It seems to be giving us a list of things. And how do we construct a list in a sentence? Well, we separate the entities with the help of commas. So on the surface, this looks like a pretty decent sentence. However, is there more to it than what meets the eye? Well, there certainly is. But how do we figure it out? How do we ensure that such sentences don't trap us when we are right in the middle of our examination. Well, it all depends on the technique or the approach you use to solve sentence correction. The technique I'm going to demonstrate now is our proprietary sentence structure analysis. If you wield this tool correctly and effectively, you can rest assured you will never fall into the trap that such sentences can throw at you. Allow me to demonstrate. The new Mega Mart sells groceries and toiletries. So I, I, I understand that right about or around the word groceries, we see the beginning of a list, right? So let's just take the first few words here because this seems to be uh, a natural pause point for us, you know. This is where the eye naturally rests before it tries to make sense of the next segment. So we know that we're talking about a new Mega Mart uh, store right and we are saying that it sells certain items now let's see what these items are groceries and toiletries on the ground floor all right let's take this so now let's keep this slightly to the right because this is the first or it appears to be the first thing that this mega mart sells let's read on Clothing and accessories on the second floor. Okay. So let's quickly take this and put it right underneath groceries because it seems to be in the same rank or a parallel entity to the previous entity. Now we also have second floor here. So let's not leave this modifier out and put it over here. Interesting. Stationery, music, books and toys on the third floor. All right, now this is another long item. And we are going to get down to meaning analysis very quickly. Just bear with me. All right. And luggage, housewares 
and electronics on the fourth floor. So as you can see here, we have created a structure and in this structure we see that at a very high level we have a list of four items. But what's interesting is that each of these entities within this super list has sub entities. For example, if I were to label each of these lists as list A, B, C and D, then we can say that groceries and toiletries are A1 and A2, clothing and accessories are B1 and B2, stationery C1, music C2, books C3 and toys C4 and then luggage, houses and electronics as D1, D2 and D3. So what we see here is that each of these entities within the list A, B, C, and D, we have sub entities A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2, C3, C4 and D1, D2, D3, D4. Ah, so there are layers to interpreting the sentence, right? You can see that we have a list within a list. Let's write that down somewhere. We have a list within a list. Very, very important. So in such a situation, what do we need to be cautious about? Let's find that. Now, what you can see here is that in such sentences, we use a comma to separate the entities of a sublist, right? So when we have already used a comma to separate the entities of the sub entities of a list, then how or why or can we use the same comma to separate the entities of the super list? So, can we say that these commas between the entities A, B, C and D are correct? Or do they create a conflict with the commas separating the entities of the sublist? And the answer is, we have a conflict on our hands. We cannot use the same punctuation for two operations of different rank. Now, what do you think? Which is the higher operation? which operation is of a higher rank or in simpler words which of these commas separate bigger or larger or more complex entities well, the answer is these ones these commas separate super entities so when you have super entities just using a comma would not suffice you would need a super comma and that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to a semicolon. A semicolon is like the elder brother of a comma. So where you need the big brother, you know, instead of using a comma, use a semicolon. So if we very quickly escalate these, let me erase this and show you what I mean. If we escalate these to semicolons, then this sentence becomes even more legible and comprehensible than earlier. And that is why using commas in such sentences would be incorrect if you are to use them to separate the super entities. Now let's apply this to our official question and see if we can figure out what's wrong with answer choice A. All right, so we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna use sentence structure analysis to make sense of this sentence. Let's get cracking. Self-compassion is made up of, okay, let's put this here. 
What is self-compassion made up of? First, mindfulness. Okay, so this is the name of a trait. Interesting. So let's call this thing the first entity. The second entity is the ability to manage thoughts and emotions. Hmm, interesting. This looks like the second entity, but let's hold on a little bit. Without being carried away or repressing them. Hmm. Now, without being carried away or repressing them seems to be the modifier of managing thoughts and emotions without being carried away or repressing them. So, this is just the continuation of this seemingly second entity, right? So, without being carried away is modifying the ability to manage thoughts and emotions, right? But the question at hand is, this is this entire thing, this ability, the second entity entity in the list that constitutes self-compassion? You must be asking yourself this question. And if it is, then why is it that this ability does not have a name, whereas the preceding ability had a name, mindfulness? Hold on to that thought while we bring in the other contenders. Common humanity. Okay, so this seems like yet another trait that constitutes self-compassion. Hmm. And what's interesting is that this quality also has a name. Mindfulness, humanity are attributes. Let's read further. Or empathy with the suffering of others. Okay. This also seems like a quality because it has a name. So let's put this here for now as the fourth possible entity in this list. And let's complete it by bringing suffering of others down here to complete it. Okay, let's read on. We will come back to this. And self-kindness. All right, we have another list here. Uh, I'm sorry, another entity here. And it also happens to have a connector before it. And just like the preceding one had or, this one has and. Hmm. Let's hold our horses. All right. And then we have another noun phrase which says, a recognition of your own suffering Okay, now this also seems to be an attribute or at least a noun phrase for now and a commitment. Okay, let's bring this guy here to solving the problem. So let's bring this chap here to complete this entity. So now let's quickly back up and look at the whole sentence from a bird's eye view. And let's give these guys, these entities, names from now onward. All right. So let's say self-compassion is made up of mindfulness. So let's call this A. Then we have the ability to manage thoughts and emotions without being carried away or repressing them. B. Common humanity. C. Empathy with the suffering of others. Let's call this D. Self-kindness, E, and recognition of your own suffering and a commitment to solving the problem. Okay. So, again, we have an and over here, which again causes confusion because we are not sure whether this is part of the recognition phrase or whether this is another entity in the list. Okay. Let's, let's humor that. Right. Let's take this a commitment to solving the problem and put it over here. And bring this and all the way here because I'm confident some of you must be wondering about this. Ah, there we are. So how many entities are there in this list? Let's understand. We were at E, F and G. So do we have seven entities in this one single list? Or is there more to this sentence than meets the eye? This is where we put our thinking caps on when we derive meaning. We create logical connections between these entities to see whether any of these entities happen to be sub-entities. Now, sub-entities could be, you know, sub-list members. They could even sometimes be modifiers of super-list entities. For instance, let's start with A and B. Mindfulness and the ability to manage thoughts and emotions without being carried away 
or repressing them. Now think for a moment, do you think there's any difference between A and B? Or is A the name for B? The ability to manage thoughts, mindful, and emotions, mindful, without being carried away, mindful, or even repressing them, mindful. Each of these actually describe the word mindfulness. Aha, so this is where we have a eureka moment because that's when we figure out just by asking these probe questions that this entire group of words is actually a modifier for the first entity A. So we can erase B as one of these entities. You see how that works? This is what we're going to replicate now and we're going to do this for every single entity. So the next one is common humanity. Now clearly common humanity has a name and it is the next entity in this list. So let's call this B. Now let's look at the next entity D, our erstwhile D or empathy with the suffering of others. Now ask yourself, empathy with the suffering of others, is this different from humanity? What does it mean to be humane? It means to empathize with people, to care, to be considerate of other people. And that is nothing but empathy with the suffering of others. This is our second Eureka moment. And we can clearly see that from a meaning perspective, this entity is a modifier of B. It's not a separate list entity. So we can erase D from here. Let's move forward. And self-kindness. And this is where we realize, I don't mean to jump the gun here, but this is where we realize that this word or is completely unnecessary. It is a non-issue. How did we do that? Just by figuring out the meaning of that phrase. Let's go down to E now and see what's happening here. Now we see that the and seems to be joining the third entity. And if it is the third entity, for this and to be correct, self-kindness should be the final entity in this list. Otherwise, we would know and is wrong. Just how we figured out or was wrong, that's how we would know whether and at the start of E is right or wrong. So let's keep self-kindness where it is, but let's look at F and see whether it is the next entity or a modification or modifier of self-kindness. A recognition of your own suffering. If you recognize your own suffering and pain, aren't you being kind to yourself? Aha, another Eureka moment. Okay, so there is a recognition. Let me just put this here of your own suffering. Okay. But then there is no comma. If this were the end of this phrase, and if commitment were the next entity, then as per the Oxford comma rule, a rule that is adhered to strictly on the GMAT, there should have been a comma before this end. So right here itself, we have a grammatical clue that we do not have G as a separate entity in this list, right? G is part of F. But even if you are not aware of the Oxford comma rule, and I promise you, I will do another video on the Oxford comma uh, to explain what that is to you. In a nutshell, when you have more than two entities in a list, A, B, C, then you must put a comma after B before the end. So it's not A, comma, B and C as it's practiced here in India. It's A, comma, B, comma and C. So that second comma before and is what we call the Oxford comma. And here, if you can see, there is no comma before the and and therefore, grammatically, we have a clue that this is part of F. G is actually part of F. But let's do a meaning analysis. And self-kindness, a recognition of your own suffering, a commitment to solving the problem. Okay, interesting. The problem refers to suffering. And if you're committing to solving the problem that you are suffering with or from, are you not being kind to yourself? There we have the final Eureka moment. So two things, the Oxford comma and even meaning analysis bring us to the conclusion that this entity is part of the modifier F. So we can get G out of the way and F out of the way. We can re-label E to C. And as you can see, finally, we have only three entities in this list. And that brings us to the million dollar question. So do we have the incorrect use of commas here? As of now, let us spot the commas, okay? So I'm going to circle those commas so that you can see them clearly. 
where all have we used commas and are they correct? Now, the first comma we see is after mindfulness. This comma separates the word mindfulness from its modifier, the ability to them. And then we have another comma at the end of A, which separates A from B. Now, as you can see, these are operations of two different hierarchies, two different ranks. And as I just explained, you cannot use the same punctuation to perform two different operations of different rank. So which is the bigger operation? Which of these two commas needs to be stronger? Which of these two commas is separating a larger grammatical entity? Drum roll. The answer is this comma. And that means we need to call in our dear elder brother of the comma over here to come and save the day. And how do we do that? What is the elder brother of a comma? Yes, you guessed right. This needs to be escalated to a semicolon. And so we are going to use a semicolon not just here, but after every single entity in this list, in the super list, after A and after B, right? Just as there is an Oxford comma, there is an Oxford semicolon. So we would have to put this semicolon here after B to suggest the ending point of entity B, right? And we can see we have the younger brother comma right after humanity in B. We have the small, the younger brother comma at the end of self-kindness in entity C. But the semicolons tell us that we need to interpret mindfulness as one entity, common humanity as the second entity and self-kindness as the third super entity. I hope this explanation was clear. If you're enjoying this video, guys, please don't forget to hit the like and the subscribe button and do share this video with anyone you might think uh, would benefit from these concepts. All right. Now, let's get back, therefore, to our original question. And let's see now if you can understand what was wrong over here. So I'm going to quickly get these out of the way. I'm going to just so that you can read this carefully, right? Right now, answer choice D had these semicolons where after the end of A, which was mindfulness, right? So we had mindfulness here at the end of mindfulness. Where does mindfulness end? Them. And so after them, we have a semicolon. Where does common humanity end? At the end of others. So at the end of others, we needed a semicolon. And this is why, ladies and gentlemen, we need the answer choice D, which has the semicolons and not A, which uses commas instead. Let's summarize what we have learned today. So the takeaways from this particular session are, number one, the use of a semicolon as a super comma, right? And more importantly, we looked at a framework. We used a tool to get ourselves out of that tight spot. And that tool is the sentence structure analysis, right? You need to be able to apply this technique so that you can see list entities in a straight line. And then you need to perform meaning analysis to figure out whether you're dealing with super entities or sub entities of lists within lists. All right. As, pro, as always, I'm going to leave you with a challenge, all right? So this is your challenge for this particular edition, right? Please give this a shot. I want you to read it carefully. I want you to create a sentence structure. You could use an application like Microsoft Whiteboard, or you could use a simple Word document and use indentation with bulleting to see which entities have to be parallel to one another. Once you do that, if in case you spot sub entities, then figure out where to put the semicolon, right? In the comments, I want you to, you know, type your answer out. I want you to say whether we need semicolons or not. And I want you to mention which word after which the semicolon must be placed, if at all. I hope you understand that, right? I look forward to your comments. I hope you enjoyed this session as much as I did, right? I'll be back again in future, guys, with another interesting find. But until then, happy learning.